Our future is behind us. Part two, getting started. As his various aches, pains, and infirmaries waned, allowing him to focus more, Chris discovered his kit was no longer attached. The pack had been fastened to his shoulders and tethered around his waist before he temporated, but clearly that hadn't guaranteed it would remain connected to him. For all he knew, the kit could have arrived at the opposite limits of his projected space and time probability. Still unable to make out any details of objects farther than a few feet away, Chris began crawling around in an expanding spiral. His search led him to a pine tree about 20 feet from where he had returned to consciousness. The kit sat on its side against the trunk. Chris imagined the scene, entering the grove like a dervish, his pack pulled from his body by the centrifugal forces and smacking into the bark of the tree before coming to rest in the soft nettle bed. His first order of business needed to be taking inventory of his supplies and ensure they remained serviceable. He pushed himself up against the trunk and pulled his pack over to sit between his splayed leg. He began pulling everything out and laying the individual items on the ground next to his thigh. All printed material, including his one and only allowed paperback, he had chosen Conrad's secret agent, was still wrapped in a composite leather pouch. The documents comprised 21 councils broken down into four sections corresponding to the Earth's quadrants. In each section, there were three subsections containing histories, testimonies, and data in two subsections displaying both photographic representations and vector graphic diagrams. Lastly, one long, lone narrative section served as a plea to action. These printed councils served as a failsafe in the event any of the electronic or mechanical versions were lost, broken, or corrupted. Their immobile quietness was less immediately persuasive than the video and audio of the other devices, but they also lent a certain gravitas to the message. Paper was rarely used in Chris's time, and any new work committed to it often garnered a kind of religious reverence. He carefully returned the documents to their carrier. Next, Chris retrieved his two devices, a small screen to project holographic video and digital audio of the information detailed in the councils, and a hermetically sealed spectrograph containing vials of soil, air, and water samples with their inbuilt capability to generate readouts of the contents. While at the center, all the recruits received extensive instructions on how to operate and care for these blocky instruments. He went through the preliminary maintenance, checks, and services as he had been trained. They appeared to be undamaged during the transit. However, he was not a technician, so until they were activated, preferably for a scientific audience, he couldn't be entirely certain they would work correctly. Optimistic and wanting to ensure he presented a reasonably respectable appearance, Chris searched for his mirror. His assignment would be short-lived if he walked out of the woods looking like a mountain man, talking about the coming end of the world. As he had expected, he looked as though he had been tossed from a moving vehicle, which really wasn't too far from the truth. He set about cleaning himself up. His pants could afford being a little scuffed and stained, however the puddle of urine in his groin had to go. Likewise, he changed his shirt since, as he had found in his reflection, blood was splattered across his shoulders, presumably from his ears. Along with the clothes he wore, he had five pairs of socks and five pairs of underwear, two short-sleeved and two long-sleeved shirts, a wool pullover, a light rain jacket, another pair of pants. He also carried a sleep roll and various camping implements such as fire-making items, two water bottles, three days of high-calorie, high-protein food packets, a flashlight, a whistle, a snare, and some fishing line with hooks. He withdrew his maps and compass. While he perused one of the 1 to 50,000 scale military style topographic maps, he ate a fruit bar. The sweet taste of blueberry and strawberry and the granola conspired to clog his mouth, so he took a swig of water to wash it down. He quickly realized the map was too large scaled. In order for him to get any bearings, he needed his small scale 1 to 100,000 map quickly identifying a river and hilltop which should be easy to locate on the ground. 
He then searched for the corresponding sheet on his other maps. He looked down the hill where he had seen the deciduous wood line, but there was nothing in sight for him to fix his position. Chris sat back and continued chewing through his fruit bar. The maps were meant to help in the event he found himself dropped into a wilderness. This was clearly the case. He just needed to find a few significant landmarks in order to figure out where to start. You should find yourself within 50 miles of your targeted location, the trainer, what was his name, Jeffries, had said. There were various topological maps spread across the table, which was also projected onto a screen to provide a clear view for the entire class. He radiated a sense of self-assurance, ensuring the students failed to question the myriad other possibilities. So the maps you receive won't likely be needed for much beyond orientation, though should effectively serve your purposes if greater distances need to be traversed. Of course, None of this is an exact science. He looked up from the table. It's more like an art. The statement had been made so many times that it had become a joke among Chris's roommates, an official motto. I can't find my other sock. Funny, I found an extra one in my drawer. Well, you know, laundry isn't an exact science. Has someone been using my shampoo? It's possible that I may have. This isn't an exact science, after all. Are these mashed potatoes or chunky paste? It could be either. Or both. It's not like cooking in this place uses an exact science. Some of the instructor trainers who said it did so with a smile, like they knew the humor of it. Others did not smile. Chris preferred the latter since it was one thing for his peers to laugh about it. It was another for their trainers to do so. Jackson had been the last one to say it to him. Chris was lying on his side in his crutch. He could feel the drugs they had administered begin working on his extremities, starting at his fingertips and toes. Jackson leaned over to adjust the straps on Chris's kit and checked his pockets for loose or undeclared items. Any words of advice? Chris had asked. The cocktail in his system made his head loopy, and the question came out with a slurred chuckle. Stay alert. This isn't an exact science. Jackson then closed the top like a casket, and blackness filled both the crutch and Chris's mind. The first frightfully painful breath of his awakening was the next thing he experienced. Chris considered that last exchange before leaving this previous place in time, the only place in time he could have even imagined six months ago. He couldn't sparse why Jackson had said it. Did he mean Chris should stay alert through the trip, or once he arrived? It made more sense if he had meant to stay alert upon arrival since the drugs were intended to effectively knock him out of consciousness during the trip. However, wasn't it already evident what he should do? What they had been trained to do? Jackson had seemed more earnest than he needed in stating the obvious. The statement was meant to be more than passing that device. It occurred to Chris that he had never questioned the need for the drugs. The process of transporting him was a physical endeavor, and it certainly was not pleasant to awake from, but there had never been any discussion of what he would experience during the trip. He had simply been told he would fall asleep there and wake up here. Perhaps the cocktail included a paralytic to prevent any movements from interfering with his transfer. How long had he been out? He wasn't particularly hungry or thirsty, so it couldn't have been long. In truth, there were no lingering effects of the drugs which he was aware of. No persistent fog in his head. No muscle or joint stiffness often accompanying anesthesia. His body sure felt beaten up a bit, but he owed that to his, what, landing? Quit stalling, Chris chided himself. He returned his attention to the task at hand. The sun bathed him in its orange warmth and appeared past its zenith, giving him an estimated four hours of daylight left. 
If he wanted to make any progress, he best get going. He collected his supplies and returned them to his kit after transferring a water bottle to the outside pocket. He placed another snack bar in the front pocket of his shirt. Chris stood and surveyed the low hilltop. A copse of pines obscured the north side. He walked a hundred meters through them to see if he could get a better view of what lay up beyond. It appeared that the range to which his hill belonged continued on to higher elevations. Chris turned back, choosing downhill instead, as his best bet in finding water and people. He would keep an eye out for the river and lone hilltop he had marked on the map. He didn't hold any honest hope of the maps being of much use. He would need to follow his instinct. As he passed through the edge of the pines, he picked up and shouldered his kit. Looking down and past the trees below, he took the bottle of water from his side pocket and drank a mouthful before beginning the descent. Chris walked all afternoon without coming across any sign of human presence. He passed no roads or power lines. He found no debris or refuse. He heard no sounds of faraway vehicles. Stopping to rest about halfway through his day's hike, he lay on his back watching clouds float by when he realized that there weren't any contrails in the sky. It worried him that he may have landed so far into the northwest, a wilderness of immense forests comprised of towering trees, thick underbrush, and verdant ferns. He decided it would be best to conserve and begin augmenting his food supplies immediately. This looked like it was going to be a longer walk than he had hoped. Luck, in one respect at least, seemed to be on his side. He had arrived in the days of late summer or very early fall. The afternoon temperature was mild, warm enough to cause a light sweat, but not so hot that he needed to shed clothing. As long as he remained at lower elevations, he should be comfortable through the nights. Another two hours of walking brought Chris to a medium-sized river. Rocky outcroppings etched over millennia on either side of the rushing water's edge. Recesses in the stone walls were sufficiently large to allow a person to crawl inside. He decided it was as good a place to stop for the night as any, so he began to set up before darkness fell. The river was wide enough that the break in the tree line allowed clear sunlight to fall along the shore. The Carillion sky shone overhead and reflected in pools of lazy water.